Good morning, Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> Special welcome to our first time guests. We are grateful to have you with us. If any of you are joining us from the wedding yesterday, the Thomas and Stanton wedding, we welcome you as well uh, to worship with us. What a beautiful wedding that was to see all that God had done and worked in those two lives. It was just beautiful and met a sweet lady this morning walking in who moved here from Florida and she had a young son who uh, Gideon was his uh, big brother and that said he just wouldn't have made it through that year without Gideon loving and nurturing him and those kind of things just lift my heart again and again. Well, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11, we are currently studying through the epistle to the Romans. Uh, we're going to close out this morning uh, three and a half years or something like that of Paul just laying out the gospel that he said, I'm unashamed of because it's the power of God to bring you into the realm of salvation. And so all the truth that we've studied and the explanations and arguments finish this morning, and then we'll shift to what the gospel should do in every heart and understand it, it's to worship God and give him all the glory and praise. All, you get all the glory for this. So a changed life will then flow from the view of you beholding the grace of God, and we'll spend our next year looking at how then shall we live in light of this gospel. So if you will pray with me for God's blessing and leading this morning. Father, my heart is full because I worship a full Christ, and His mercy is abounding for all who call upon that name. And so God, we thank you that you are a God like this. You are a God full of mercy willing to take iniquity and separate him as far as the east is from the west because you would not spare your own son but delivered him up for us all and pierced him through for our transgressions. And so, God, we gather as the people of God to worship you for this truth. God, I pray that now as we continue worshiping in this word that you would just be put on display and all hearts would marvel at the merciful God that we serve. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. We've seen the, the guilt and the depravity of humanity. We began in chapters 1 through 3, and Paul wanted us to see that the immoral and the immoral are both under the judgment of God, those who are trying to keep the law of God and those who are suppressing God by creation and knowing that there was a God. And so whether you're religious or irreligious or moral or immoral, you stand in sin and guilt before this God. And Paul says you need to know the bad news before you'll ever understand the good news. And we've seen it, just the baptisms in the last couple of years, we, we've seen witches, we've seen drug addicts, sex addicts, and sweet little kids raised in the church who were immoral uh, and learned that they needed a savior. And so it's just Romans in a beautiful nutshell that God shows mercy to the greatest of sinners, to the cleanest of sinners. And so thank you, God, for this gospel. And we came to Romans 3.21 with two of my favorite words, but now there's, there's just no way to get right with God by cleaning up and being a good person. So God's done it. God has made a way to make us righteous before him, accepted and loved. And it's a salvation that comes by God alone through grace alone. It's His doing. He sent His Son into the world, and it's His work alone that can save. And He came, and He went up on a cross, and He bore the wrath of God, and He, was, he died and was buried and raised on the third day. And by His life of coming, the, the law must be fulfilled, righteousness. We must be perfectly righteous to be in the presence of God. And Jesus came, and He gave that to us now as a gift. So in his son's work alone, can we stand in the presence of God? And Paul labored to show you the way you get this gospel is not by working and cleaning up. It's by holding out an empty hand that looks only to Jesus Christ and receives this free gift, believing in what God has done in his son. And by that gospel, he brings us near. He joins us to Jesus Christ. And in Romans 5 now, instead of standing in wrath, you stand in the grace and the favor and the love of God adopted as his children. And that is the springboard for holy lives. And we looked in Romans 6.14 that sin won't have dominion over you now, child of God. 
Because you're not under the law any longer. You're now under grace. You stand in the favor of God and the connection with Jesus Christ and his power. Grace is a power. And it gives you a power now to fulfill the law, to love God and to love others. And so you were buried with Christ in baptism, joined to him. You died what you were in Adam. You've been raised a new creation to walk in newness of life. You're not under the law. You're under grace. And you've been adopted as sons and daughters, and you have the Holy Spirit of God put within you now to change you from one image of glory to the next and to bring you to heaven and perfect you. Glorification, you will be saved to sin no more, and you will behold Christ forever. And nothing can stop God in doing this in our lives. Not us, not the devil. No one can stop what God has begun, and he will bring you safe to glory. (laughs) I should say amen. God holds us. and Nothing will ever separate us from his love. My fingers are all dry from the baptismal, so work with me. This message then will go to the ends of the earth. And Israel would not heed this message. They would not submit to their Savior uh, for his kind of righteousness. They kept trying to do it under the law, so they rejected their Messiah and they killed him. And so the question we've been looking at in Romans 9 through 11, then, is Israel's relationship with God over? There's been a remnant throughout history. We saw in Romans 9 that God chose different ones to be saved. Not all Israel is Israel, he said, but there's a remnant that I pull out and I choose And then we moved into chapter 11, and Paul says, what about ethnic Israel? They were hardened. They did not obtain God's favor down to this very day. 11, 11, Romans says, I say then, they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to the world, to make them jealous. And so they've been hardened until the fullness of all the Gentiles are brought into this gospel. And so the purposes of God are being revealed in this mystery in Romans. There's a hardening to Israel. He had a great purpose to let his mercy overflow the banks to all the nations, to everyone sitting here this morning, to bring the elect Gentiles from the ends of the earth, from every tribe, tongue, and nation to Jesus Christ and believe. And so the Jewish rejection brought riches to the world, Paul said. How much more will their fulfillment be but life from the dead? And then Paul counters the pride of the Gentiles by this providence. He says, don't be arrogant toward the natural branches, the Jews. Quit being prideful and thinking there's something special in you. If you got rid of natural branches, it'll be a lot easier to cut off unnatural ones. Behold the kindness and the severity of God. If he did this to Israel and their pride and their unbelief, how much more against nature branches that were engrafted in? And we're told that God is able to graft in the natural branches uh, at the end. He's able and he is willing. And so this mystery is God's dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles throughout redemptive history. And we will close up that mystery this morning. Paul, true to form, He'll take the statement that we looked at last week, and now all Israel will be saved. And now he's going to prove it three ways in the last verses. First, scripturally, he's going to show that this was promised in the Old Testament. Then he's going to show it theologically in verses 28 through 29 by a pledge that he made to the fathers. And then he's going to do it practically to magnify his mercy to the ends of the earth. So if you'll come with me to verse 26 where we left off. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so new covenant talk, this covenant of removing sins from east is the west and forgiveness. And so this is a quote from Isaiah 59, 20 through 21. Isaiah 27, 9. And the last line, he quotes Isaiah 27. So I just want to read to you Isaiah 59, 20 through 21. And a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. 
My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. And so just the context, Israel is separated from God on account of their great sins, which is kind of the history of the nation. 59, Isaiah 59, 1 through 8, he, God describes their deep depravity and the sin that is going on. And then in Isaiah 59, 9 through 15, we see Israel's plight, that there, there's no one who can help them. They're stumbling. They're groping around, it says, and salvation is far from us. We need deliverance. We need help. And in this context, then, God takes the initiative with regard to this sinful nation, which is all of salvation. God takes initiative because we're just falling all over the place, stumbling and can't find him. Isaiah 59, 15, yes, truth is lacking and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, that there was no justice in the land. And so God looks out and he says, there's no one to help. There's no one to intercede for this sinful people. And so God says, my own arm is going to bring salvation to them. Again, the initiative of God to their disobedience. And then we see Isaiah 59, 20 through 21 that I just read is the promise of God's redemption in the midst of their disobedience, as they are far from him. And now Paul takes these words and he applies them to Israel's restoration. He says, a deliverer will come from Zion. The deliverer is God himself. Paul says, Jesus Christ is that one. A deliverer will come. And the question is, when does he come? And again, there's debate as, was that the incarnation when he came and he came to do the work of salvation and to banish sin? Or is it that second coming to give life from the dead here, uh, that the way I looked at it in Romans 11? So I continue to lean on the second coming. The first coming, he, he set the foundation work for the forgiveness of sins. And at the second coming will be the fulfillment of all that that first coming established. And he says he'll come and he's going to remove ungodliness from Jacob. And currently Israel sits in hardened unbelief They've rejected Messiah and his first coming, and Paul looks at Israel and they're rejecting, and he looks to this day when their ungodliness will be taken away, and there'll be spiritual renewal by faith, and the removal of this hardness and their rejection of Messiah. And verse 26, according to the covenant that I made with them, this new covenant in Isaiah 59, verse 27, I will remove their sins, and they will look upon whom they've pierced. And they will come to the fountain, Jesus Christ, for that cleansing blood. The removal of sin, so beautiful. And so this could be a remnant, but it still seems to me uh, it's national and broad again. And so this promise is going to be this national salvation here toward the end of history. So that is what I see scripturally. And then theologically, I think he's now going to prove it in verses 28 through 29. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, and that's this national Israel. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they, national Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And so you, these are two parallel clauses in structure and from the standpoint of the gospel, they're, they're enemies. Israel, for your sake, so that the gospel will go out and bring in the nations. But now from the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers when God set his love on this nation. And so from the standpoint of God's choice, the, the Greek is the election, they're loved. And they're loved because of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they're rejectors and they're haters, but the purpose of God, he says, they're choice and they're loved and they're serving my purpose, which we'll see at the end of the passage. So they're currently broken off for their unbelief. They're hostile to the gospel, but they're still loved because of the promises that God made to the fathers. And so this is a, a national election. I don't see it as the election of Romans 9 that we studied, but these people that have been chosen by God are now regarded as enemies, and that doesn't fit well with election unto grace, that they're enemies. So this is more dealing with God's eternal purpose of his election with Israel. 
God's choosing of a nation for a special purpose in outworking his redemptive plan. And he chose them and he set his love on them. And Moses says, not because they were more in number, not because uh, they were righteous or special, just because I did. I set my love on this nation because I chose to. And I keep my oath that I made with their fathers of a promise, this blessing, his undying commitment to them. Israel's not going to be written off. They're God's chosen people. They're the fathers that were beloved and this promise given to. And so from this standpoint, they're regarded as beloved. And they're now regarded as enemies temporarily for the sake of the gospel for us Gentiles. So my question is, why is this true of this nation? They, every prophet they stoned and they send the son of God and they kill him. Well, in verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And the calling of God is God, God called out Abraham. I'm going to make you a father of many nations and the father of faith. And his call is that which puts his plan into action. And this plan was in the heart of God before the foundation of the world. And this was his call and his purpose for the nation of Israel. And so the calling of God is irrevocable, his plan for this nation, and the gifts that, that they were given, the covenants, the promises and all the things in Romans 9, 4 through 5 that we already looked at. And so these gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The Greek word means not capable of being changed, not to be taken back or inflexible. And so what about those in the wilderness who rejected him? What about all the cycles and judges? They just kept rejecting apostasy again and again. What about all, you read the, the kings, just one evil king after another offering up sacrifices to Molech. What about their treatment of the prophets and the Christ? Surely God cast them off. No, they're regarded as enemies right now for the sake of the gospel. But my election on that nation is irrevocable. God has cast them out through the Babylonians. He brought the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, but he has not finished with them. Even now, there's a temporary blindness where they're treated as enemies. The city's been destroyed. They've been spread abroad throughout the history. But the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And what God has promised to the fathers will happen, and it will be life from the dead. And what is more, catch this, the fathers, it was nothing that they did either. Abraham was a worshiper of stars. <laughs> so it's not the patriarchs themselves uh, that, that the Jews are still beloved. There was nothing in them. It was the promises of God that was made to them for his purpose. And this whole section is when God chooses for a purpose to save you and keep you and bring you to the end, nothing can stop it. Greg talked this morning that in Hebrews 6, God made an oath by himself. I swear by myself that I will keep this promise. Who, can you, who more can you, you can't go any higher. I swear by myself, God says, I will keep my promise to bring you to the end. That needs to do something to your heart as you sit here this morning. The God of the universe is faithful to the promise to his children to bring you to glory. I, I try to mess it up, and I can't. He brings me to repentance, and he keeps leading me to love Jesus Christ. So we see the faithfulness of Almighty God. He doesn't flinch. He keeps his promises. And so Israel has been unfaithful, but God cannot be. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful. And so again, this is not just for the Jews. But this is all the way back to Romans 8, 38 through 39, that when God calls us into relationship with him through Jesus Christ, it's irrevocable. It can't be taken away. We are anchored in the faithfulness of God this morning. That's why I'm so confident. I, if I look at me, I have no confidence. But I am anchored in the faithfulness of God. And, and I just see so many faces here that he just has stayed with you and kept you and is carrying you through trial after trial. We're just a big group of, of believers who are praising God for his faithfulness to us and worshiping him in this gospel. 2 Corinthians 1.18, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 24, Paul says, Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Hebrews 10, 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Revelation, 1 Peter 4, 19, Let those who suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. In every trial and affliction this morning, he's faithful to do what is right. Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he wages war. So scripturally, I'll banish iniquity. Theologically, his pro the calling and promise of God are irrevocable. And then this morning, I want to look at the heart of this that practically in verses 30 through 32. And my question is, why is it done this way? Has anyone asked that? Because we're going to get to the doxology next week, and he's going to say, who's become his counselor? <laughs> don't counsel God. <laughs> if you get anything from Romans, don't counsel God. Paul is going to now summarize why has God ran all of history in this fashion. He's going to make it more explicit and plain, and I think he's going to make it as clear as possible for us. So thank you for everyone who's journeyed and labored in some of these details, and now he's just going to make it real succinct, and I don't think anyone here can miss it. There's just one word answer, and, and the answer is mercy. Mercy. Verse 30. For just as you once were disobedient to God, Gentiles, but now you have been shown mercy because of the Jewish rebellion and disobedience to God. So you Gentiles were disobedient. We studied that in Romans 1.18 through 32. We wanted to be God and creation tells us there's a God and we suppressed it because we love our unrighteousness and we don't want to deal with God. And it just preaches every day there's a God and you're like, no, I'm suppressing this because I want to call my own shots. I want to say how I want to live. And, and we were just godless in every way. We were outside the kingdom of God. You were strangers. You were without God. You, you had no hope. Just blind and ignorant and disobedient. That's all of our testimonies. But now, God has been shown mercy. Salvation is the result of the mercy of God. There's nothing in man. There's nothing in you that turns God to be merciful except our pityness. God's mercy led to new life and us being grafted into the promises of the gospel. The mercy of God is why you sit here this morning exalting and worshiping. Because of their disobedience. Paul reminds the Gentiles again, you got mercy because of their rejection. Don't throw your chest out there. You were outside and the only reason you sit in the covenant, the new covenant promise this morning is the mercy of God. And he did it by the disobedience of the Jews and the work of his son. Acts 13.45 when the Jews saw all the crowds here in this gospel, they were filled with jealousy and they began contradicting the things spoken by the apostle Paul and they were blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. And since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles for thus the Lord has commanded us with this Old Testament quote, I've placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. They didn't get prideful. And they said, as many as been appointed to eternal life believe this gospel. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. It's going to the Gentiles right now. Thank you, God, for this plan. And so in verse 31, and so these also, there's the parallelism now. These also is the Jewish nation, the bulk of them. This bulk have now been disobedient. They have been disobeying. They kill Messiah. They reject true righteousness. And he says, in order that, here's the purpose clause. Why? That they also may now be shown mercy. So before the coming of Christ, the Gentiles were the unbelievers and they were outside and they were dead and without God. 
And the Jews were God's people with the oracles and the workings of God and all the miracles. The Son of God came and it just all reversed. The end of the Old Testament, the Jewish nation is waiting for the coming of Messiah. And in the Gospels, we watch them reject Him. Branches are torn out and they're put on the outside. And on the inside now, through the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Gentiles are crowding into the promises of God in Jesus Christ. And so it is today. And it's not the end of the story because it's a mystery he's telling us. All those centuries were Jews, Jews, Jews. Christ comes on and now it's Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. And there's just one explanation for this in verse 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all. To shut up means to stop the mouth. I'm going to go back and read something in Romans 3 to you. Romans 3, listen to verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world might become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, but through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so it's to shut our mouths that there's no boast in anything in us. We're sinners. We can't change our nature. We can't change anything. Silence. It means to shut up completely. Luke 5, 6, it meant to shut up a fish in a net, to enclose them. And so God has shut up everybody. There's a purpose for his plan. And it's the whole nation, Jew and Gentile, it's just to shut our mouths before him with our boastings and our goodness and our righteousness, just be silenced and guilty and defiled. And the Jews, Gentiles are shut up in unbelief because of the disobedience. And the Jews now are shut up in unbelief and disobedience. All of us are just locked up in prison. Romans 3, 9 says both Jew and Gentile are under sin. And that Greek word is under the dominion of sin. We're all under the rule and the reign of sin, and we just need to be quiet before God. No boasting, no, I'm going to change, I'm going to transform, just stop. The gospel is to shut your mouth. I have nothing to bring to you, God, but sin. And the most blessed henna clause, maybe in the Bible, it's a purpose clause. Why would you do that, God? Why did you shut us all up? and disobedience by the way you've worked throughout history. And he said that he might show mercy to all. Mercy is the only key that can open the prison door that we live in by sin. Wesley said, fast bound in sin in nature's night. My eye diffused a quickening ray. My dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off and I rose went forth and followed thee. All of us are shut up in a prison cell. And the mercy of God invaded our lives. And God did it this way to show us that salvation is always and only by the mercy and grace of God. Even election, everything we studied is to shut our mouths for any boasting. Silenced. You get the glory. There is nothing to commend ourselves to God. There is nothing to boast in. Those testimonies I loved. You could boast in your religion and God shut your mouth. Praise Him. Salvation is entirely God's mercy. The Jews were made helpless. Gentiles were made helpless, that all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will receive mercy. He's abounding in riches and mercy to all who will call upon his name. God has deliberately emphasized the hopelessness and the helplessness of both Jew and Gentile so that you would get the only way in is the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. There is only one thing that can bring a Jew or Gentile to heaven. And it's just pure mercy. In Matthew eleven twenty five, Jesus said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that thou didst hide these things from the wise and the intelligent, and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, says Jesus, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. It's a sheer mercy if you see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ in your shut-up state to look upon him as your Savior. That is a miracle. And I don't see it a lot in our world. Paul said, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified and to Jews it's a stumbling block and to Gentiles it's foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God for salvation. Any soul that will ever be saved is by the mercy of God. And that's what unifies us. God has an incredible plan to have Jews and Gentiles hardened in sin and unbelief and no ability to change and have a but now and, and at the fullness of the time, he sent his son into this world to do everything necessary for your salvation. It's an unbelievable plan, and it's all of God. So that we'll all come to, gra- to glory forever by free grace and free mercy. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will fall at the feet of Christ and say, salvation belongs to our God. By mercy alone, I stand. That's going to be your eternal song, and it begins at salvation. Have you entered into that song? Mercy alone. I've been brought lower again through my three and a half years in Romans, and my conclusion as I stand here, it's all of mercy. I'm learning more and more. There's no hope in me. (laughs) The mercy of God is our treasure and our hope. And I get giddy when I realize that all of history has existed to show the mercy of God so he gets all the glory for salvation. Thousands of of years unfolding mercy. Our God delights to show mercy to those who have been shut up. This mercy flows poverty of spirit, to those who got nothing to offer to God, just broken in all of your sin and destruction, just looks to God and cries for mercy, he runs to. Anyone who calls upon his name, son of David, have mercy on me. Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. And the bottom line is by this way, he gets all the glory He'll have no competitors. Have you been brought to that sweet place? It's the sweetest place to be. You might be wrestling and fighting God right now, and he's going to love you and bring you to this place. Mercy to the ones who have been shut up in their disobedience. All of history is to put on display the gloriously merciful God. How do you like the view from the top? That was worth the hike. I don't ever want to come down from this mountain. The view is altogether lovely. And it's Christ, the fountain of mercy. I'm going to close. A few weeks back after Sunday school, there was a lady sitting there weeping. And I just went over and I said, what's wrong? And with tears, she just said, I'm so unworthy of this salvation. That's the best thing someone could ever say. Because her only hope was mercy instead of making herself worthy. If God's design is to show mercy to those who have no claim of their own, how can you this morning stay away from God because you're undeserving? 
The whole plan is for that. Undeserving sinners looking to Christ alone. Hold out an empty hand and say, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus says, that's the one who will go home justified. This is the only explanation for history. There are all these philosophies and all that are out there, but the conclusion of of any good philosopher, there's no great person, there's no reason for anything, things just happen, there's no plan, there's no direction, it's hopeless. And what we've seen in Romans is everything is under the hand of God with perfect purpose and detail. He rules over all. He has a glorious plan. That's what's going to happen. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Mercy. Every single part is just a member of the whole. Everything that happens perfectly according to his timetable. And in the fullness of the time, he sent forth his son. So just a couple thoughts, pastoral thoughts. Things are not always what they appear on the surface. It looks like the Jewish race just done. Never could be saved. They crucified their Savior. Yet it was all in God's perfect plan to show mercy to Jew and Gentile. And if you think your circumstances are that God is against you, and I know there's times where it sure feels that way when it's wave after wave after wave, What appears to be thoroughly bad may be used of God in this great purpose of giving mercy to you and causing you to treasure mercy more and more. That is the love of God. Things that seem the most antagonistic to God's purposes are not. I still think of 9-11 and my heart to anyone who lost a loved one In that, I just, I care what happened. And so no disrespect for any loss of life. But it broke open the door to millions of Muslims who are being saved all around the world since that day because they realized what their religion was about. And so God is unfolding a plan that we just marvel and worship at. And so big things and the small things of my day-to-day life are all ordered under this God to bring all of this into a climax of worshiping Him forever as a merciful, saving God in the most amazing way in His Son. And then just comfort. No case is hopeless. The Jews were looking for their Messiah for thousands of years and they killed Him. Doesn't that seem hopeless? God's able to graft Him back in. So if you've been praying for a loved one or a friend, a neighbor who's not a Christian, and sometimes you say, it just feels hopeless. Salvation is of God, and he can save anybody on a dime. God can overcome any enmity, as he's going to do it with millions. Hardest hearts, boom, in a word. So as I close out, don't miss this whole section is that God is free to act as he pleases and to show mercy to whom he pleases. And he is faithful. When he makes a promise, he'll keep it. And so nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What about Israel? I got a great answer. God's faithful to his promises. So put your head down on Romans 8, 28, that he causes all things to work together for good. And so I guess as I close out, the whole plan of history is to shut us up in our sin and our disobedience, to receive the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, to call upon Him. So please don't sit here and say, God's not merciful. There's no hope. Guys, this was His very glory we saw in Romans 9 to show mercy to sinners. This glorifies God. And if his whole plan is to show mercy to just broken sinners, don't be a broken sinner and say, there's no hope for me. The whole world exists for your hope. This is what God's doing. So if you're hopeless and you've come here this morning, I want you to just see, don't fall into that. There's hope. 
This whole thing is God wants to show mercy to a broken person who can't pull yourself up by the bootstraps, fix yourself, get yourself right with God. Just cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me, and he will come and show mercy to the one shut up in their sin and that I have no ability to deserve this. Hallelujah. All right, I'll shut up. Before I do, though, I, there was a... Uh, this has nothing to do with my message, but at the wedding yesterday, there was a picture of the four oldest Franco kids, and they haven't been together and seen each other, and so just love you guys. What a joy that was to see you all together. All right, that was for free. I'll pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you. If you were a God who was just, just, we would all perish rightfully for all of eternity. But your plan was so big. It was to be a just God who would be just to his own son and pour out the sword of wrath, of justice upon him for three hours on a cross and, and the wrath that we deserved so that you could show mercy and not violate your character, your justice, your, your essence. What a plan. Thank you that... The, the, the heart and soul of our God is merciful and that you would send your own son to do the work so that you could be merciful freely, fully, and truly. And you have called us into that mercy, Jew and Gentile. Thank you for shutting our mouths. Thank you for shutting us down to our own self-justification so that we would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive mercy and find times of healing. God, thank you this glorious gospel, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.